First, thank you very much for the friendly invitation and the very good organization. And I'm very, ins I have to say, I'm very inspired by this interdisciplinary approach to uh, this um, theme. And, um, and I'm personally very touched to be uh, remembered to Asini Borisovic Raginsky today um, twice. Um, who came to visit Buchenwald Memorial as well and uh, who was very important for our work there. Um, studying the program, I, was, I paused um, reading the term tainted biographies in the title of Nancy Adler's speech. Inspired by this expression, I will try also to use the term tainted biographies in the context of my topic, though it will certainly differ uh, from, the way, from the way Nancy Adler introduced it. This term, or rather the picture it conjures, um, seems to address some of the fundamental questions concerning the following topic as well. Even though the history of special camps in the occupied German territory after World War II, 1945 to 1950, is a very exceptional phenomenon in the history of the Soviet Gulag. Concerning Soviet special camps in Eastern Germany after the war, the term tainted biography seems to characterize the fate of the camp inmates in three different ways. First, you see, for example, the expression akraska on the original documents registering the inmates of Soviet special camps. It means more colored or stained, more than maybe tainted, as a um, historical term in the documents, it means here the accusation of the unconvicted, uh, un not a convicted prisoner, the, the so-called Spetskontingent, also one of these bureaucratic terms of in, in this Soviet history, marking a special kind of uh, people who um, could be um, um, be de in detention for or could be deported. Um, here you see the so-called Spetskontingent. Um, they were brought in February 1947 under guard from the special camp number two, Buchenwald, uh, to um, prisoner of war camps in Karaganda, Kazakhstan. Of 15,000 inmates in December 1946 in the special camp number two, only 1,000 were assessed um, as able to work at that time which says a lot about the living, uh, the terrible living conditions in this camp. A second, a tainted can be used to characterize the impact of internment in Soviet special camps. Many former inmates who stayed in the GDR after their dismissal, um, when, the, when they were released from the camp, they recall that their biography uh, seemed to be tainted or seemed to be maculated. For many former inmates, their return home from special camp was associated with new bitter experiences. They learned of the death of close relatives, often years after the fact, as they were not um, allowed to um, get letters in the camp. Marriages and friendships had not with withstood the pressure of um, years of uncertainty. Internment in Soviet special camp meant that no information was given to relatives and no information about um, death, death inmate, the death of inmates. Reintegration into employment or into vocational training was often subject to the despotism of the authorities. Some remember repeated difficulties in the staff departments as if their personal files, the so-called Kada Akte, was immaculated as well. But not all of them had the same difficulties. If the professional experience of former inmates was needed, especially in, in technical um, uh, professions, um, then they were integrated in the GDR quite su successfully. But the Secret Service, the Stasi, often kept an eye on them. And one former inmate said in an interview in the 1990s that even though he had no difficulties in finding work after his release from the camp as he could work in his father's uh, carpentry, he had the impression that any time um, he was in town, 
someone was following him. A large number of the persons released gradually realized that despite of the guarantee of equal treatment, their everyday lives were dominant, dominated by mistrust and spying. So many of them uh, left the GDR in the time um, as this was possible. Now um, I come to this another aspect. Um, third, concerning the question of historical education, the documentation and remembrance, we find indeed that some of the biographies of internees in the special camp can be ta called tainted or controversial, but from a very, from another point of view, and I show you these pictures you might not expect <laughs> in this context. Um, uh, the man you see on the left, Otto von Kurzel, was born 1884 in St. Petersburg in a German Baltic family. He studied architecture in Riga. He became a painter in Munich after World War I. He was part of the um, German Baltic circle surrounding and supporting Hitler and became a member of the NSDAP from its early beginnings. He was part of the unsuccessful Hitler Putsch in Munich in 1923. He can, can be seen as an agent for the coalition of anti-Semitism and anti-Bolshevism, as the popular anti-Soviet sentiment was called during Weimar Republic in Germany. In his widely published drawings, he vilified leading politicians of the Weimar Republic, such as Defense Minister Gustav Noske and others. In um, 1921, he published this brochure, which was called Die Toten Gräber Russlands, Russia's Grave Diggers, um, with anti-Semitic caricatures of leading Soviet politicians and uh, 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 Soviet um, Bolshevists. In the National Socialist Government, he became member of the SS and of the SR, and worked in the combined sphere of culture and politics. Um, he also continued to paint uh, his um, pictures of portraits of Hitler in oil and ink were uh, widely known and widespread. Um, after the war, he was interned in different Soviet camps. Um, the Soviet documents list his enrollment in the SA as a reason for his internment. During his imprisonment, he continued to paint because of his knowledge of Russian, he managed to be asked to portray the Soviet camp personnel, his function as a painter, so though help, helped him to get additional food. He also portrayed his starving comrades. You see the picture on the right. This is a, um, <coughs> um, about um, how um, the dead in the um, the dead were buried in the Soviet special camp. He um, painted this um, after his release. Um, these drawings were very uh, common illustrations of the suffering in Soviet special camps. And to uh, um, introduce you to the range of prisoners in the Soviet special camp, I um, present you another very different biography. It shows the wide range of arrests. Ellie Marshall, she was born in 1922, lived until 1991. She was born in Thuringia as a daughter of a construction worker. At, at the age of 14, she joined the Frauenschaft, the youth organization of the uh, Nazi party. Um, she held no functions in, um, in, in this organization and worked as an assistant in a grocery shop. In um, 1945, she was arrested together with the shop owner. And the official reason for imprisonment was anti-Soviet agita agitation. Um, she had wrapped the groceries in old Nazi propaganda newspapers, which were published in Russian language, which she couldn't read because she, she didn't know Russian. While Elze, the shop owner, um, was released in 1948. Ellie stayed in the camp and even was convicted 1950 in the Waldheim Penitentiary to five years of prison sentence. In her case, which was very exceptional, the five years imprisonment um, 
included the previous internment in the special camp from 1945 on so that she was dismissed in December 1950. After her release, she worked again as a sales clerk and stayed in Thuringia. Um, just two remarks to this very different biography. Um, here you see Ellie was interned as an alleged anti-Soviet agitator, while um, Otto von Kosell, uh, with his anti-Soviet propaganda, was interned because of his former function in the SA, um, in his enrollment there. And the second remark I um, um, uh, is related to the um, gender questions we see here. Um, well, we often uh, represent the so-called innocent victim with a picture of a young woman. I could, ha in this case, I, um, I did it unconsciously. It just um, so I could, of course, have present presented here a young man um, being interned for his enrollment in youth organizations and a and a woman um, who had been a perpetrator as a uh, as a. Um, guardian in a concentration camp for women as, um, as well. These short biographic introductions lead to the question, how do we commem commemorate these uh, complex biographies? In short, on one side we have perpetrators who had all different kinds of responsibility, who later became victims of Stalinist repression, and on the other side we have victims of Stalinist internment measures who cannot be made responsible for any engagement in Nazi state or party apparatus. How can we represent and discuss these complex stories in our ex exhibitions and our educational work with scholars? How can we make this contrariness and ambivalence in the history of the 20th century productive? Um, before further addressing these questions, I will try to give you a very short introduction into the history of Soviet special camps in the occupation zone. Soviet special camps are an exception in the history of the Soviet Gulag. After World War II had ended with the unconditional surrender of Germany, the anti-Hitler coalition was confronted with the remnants of a state that had invaded nearly all of Europe, enslaving and annihilating millions of people in the process. Denazification was considered an unconditional prerequisite for building new and peaceful structures. In order to guarantee the security of the occupation um, forces, the USA and the Soviet Union had first worked out a wide range of categories for internment. As internment camps, the four allied forces used former concentration or uh, PUW camps such as Dachau, Neuengamme, Mühlberg or Buchenwald. Altogether, in all zones, about 500,000 people were interned, 160,000 of them in the Soviet zone, <coughs> in these so-called special camps. So also, uh, although the orini original aims were, for were formulated similarly, the practical implementation differed very fundamentally. The considerable differences between the Soviet special camps and the internment camps of the Western Allies were namely the duration and the conditions of imprisonment, the ensuing mortality, the composition of the camp society, and the manner in which reasons for imprisonment were investigated or not investigated at all. In the Soviet occupation zone, the personnel of the NKVD, who were trained in the Stalinist prison system, were responsible to assert who had to be prosecuted as a war criminal and who had to be turned as, a threat to as an alleged threat to occupation forces, or who was assumed to endanger the new political order. The arrests were carried out by Soviet security organizations and the German police. Um, um, they began in the spring of 1945. Members of NS organizations and national socialist organizations and the Wehrmacht were called upon to register with the authorities. Some persons were arrested due to the inclusion of their names in lists of former um, National Socialist members and functionaries, others on the base of denunciations, 
or information um, provided by other civilians. Without being informed of further details as to the reasons for their arrest, the suspects were seized at their homes. Statements made by those already in custody led to further arrests. The interrogations carried out in the prisons were often accompanied by mental and physical coercive measures. <clears throat> Following their arrest, the suspects were initially held in temporary confinement spaces um, under the jury jurisdiction of the Soviet secret police. In Turingia alone, there were 70 sites of these interim detention cells, where, from which 7,000 people were taken to the special camp number two, the former National Socialist concentration camp Buchenwald. Violence accompanied the interrogations carried out in these cells. Many prison inmates experienced the interrogations which were conducted primarily at night as a shock. And often they became aware of the full significance of their arrest only during these um, sessions. <coughs> the prisons were <coughs> extremely overcrowded and the facilities were more than inadequate. Um, there was no uh, pro sufficient provision with food or clothing um, and um <coughs> This um, and the relatives could not um, uh, support them, could not bring any um, packages with food or clothing, uh, only, only in some cases. Without formal examination, the majority of the interned were kept in detainment um, for three to five years, isolated and subjected to malnutrition and unsanitary conditions. In the special camp number two, Buchenwald, every fourth inmate died. In all special camps, Soviet special camps in Germany together, every third prisoner died. In 1948, after many, um, one third of the prisoners was released, the conditions got better. And after, okay, <laughs> um, the foundation of the GDR in the beginning of 1950, the camps were dissolved. Um, the SED system in the GDR placed the topic of the special camp um, under taboo. Every form of um, confrontation, confrontation with this aspect was prohibited. The graveyards of the special camp remained unrecognizable and no site for the commemoration of the dead was to be established. Um, there was no notification about the dead to send to the family. So the, after... Um, the German reunification, the discussion um, uh, about um, the remembrance of special camps was um, a very, uh, was uh, uh, only began. And um, later the graveyards were marked. Uh, this is to show the, dis the public discussions about how um, the memorials should be um, changed. And um, in the later on, um, this is the first uh, exhibition. And in the build, new building of the exhi exhibition, there's a um, the wall has a, um, on on the uh, near to the desk where the book of the dead lies. Um, the wall is splitted, and from there you see the forest, and you see something that uh, does not belong to th the forest. You see. Um, um, and these marks who mark um, the anonymous uh, graveyards. <coughs> um, so I, I should c um, come to an end now, um, but <laughs> um, um, well, concerning the testimonies of former inmates of the special camps, you have, of course, different, um, very different um, memories, and you have to see um, which um, category or which um, age group the order belongs. You have the young people and the um, former adults, and um, the, um, they all assess um, the past in a different way. Um, I just uh, want to um, 
all these examples can, of course, only shed some light on the difficulties how to remember the experience of imprisonment in Soviet special camps in Germany after war. Um, in, uh, in the morning, um, at the speech of Professor Moltmann, I was um, remembered also to one um, also former inmate of the Soviet special camp, um, Richard Nevermann, who was born in 1923 um, as, and he, who was interned as also as a member of the Hitler Jugend. He um, was interned fr from 1945 to 1948. And later, uh, after his release, beca he became a Protestant theologist. And he, um, remembering his interment, he, um, <clears throat> which is very interesting, he saw his internment as a time of both of suffering and learning. And his, in his memoirs, he even recalls that he had been released in 1948 too early. And he was one of the founders of the Aktion uh, Sühnezeichen, which was uh, cited also in the speech of Professor Moltmann, uh, who is br now bringing volunteers from uh, Germany to Israel, Russia, Ukraine, and also from um, these countries to, um, the, also to our memorial. Okay, I shortened it. Thank you very much.